Okay, so it is my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Um, Prineha Narang is an assistant professor at the John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University. Prior to joining the faculty, Prineha came to Harvard as a ZIF fellow and worked as a research scholar in the condensed matter theory at the MIT Department of Physics. She received an MS and PhD in applied physics from um, Caltech. Um, Prina has research focuses on how quantum systems behave, particularly far away from equilibrium, and how to harness these effects. By creating predictive theoretical and computational approaches to study dynamics, decoherence, and correlations in molecules of matter, her work will enable technologies that are inherently more powerful than their classical counterparts, ranging from scalable quantum information processing to ultra-high efficiency optoelectric and energy conversion schemes. Prina has been the recipient of many awards and special designations, including an NSF Career Award, the Gordon and Betty Moore Found Foundation's Inventor Fellowship, the Can Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, a Serial Global Scholar Award, an MIT Tech Review Top Innovator, and in 2017, she was named by Forbes Magazine 30 Under 30 list for her work in Atom by Atom Quantum Engineering. Prineha works towards the commercialization of quantum information processing and is also the CTO and co-founder of Alerio Quantum, a Boston-based VC-backed startup. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor uh, Priyana Narang. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dana, and thank you for, for having me here. Um, Will is a very hard act to follow, but I hope I can get you excited about predicting and, and controlling the various degrees of freedom in artificial atom qubits. I will tell you about how we, how we think about these uh, systems, how we go about predicting them, and how we really think of them as systems and not just as, as isolated um, quantum defects. None of this would be possible without the talented group uh, here working with me and uh, collaborations, many fruitful collaborations with uh, experimental groups and, and maybe the, there are some future collaborators on, on the call here today. So we take a broad view of predicting and controlling quantum systems. We think about correlated electronic structure methods, in particular methods that can tell us about the individual qubits, but also their coupling with each other. And, and of course, if they're hosted in, in a lattice, as I'll, I'll tell you, their coupling to the lattice becomes extremely important. As we think about these emitters, it is uh, important for us to, to think of uh, our, our system as an essentially an open quantum system. So we, we take methods from, from open quantum systems and apply them to um, the, the, the artificial atom qubits here that I'll talk about. We also think about their coupling to the cavity and exploring regimes of strong and ultra strong coupling of these emitters. And that's where uh, some of the methods that we've developed in, in QED comes into play. Going forward, of course, we are very excited that there are some of these calculations that could not only run on classical devices, but also run on, on quantum computers. So, so we also think about algorithm design that would allow us to solve problems in correlated quantum matter that you couldn't do on classical systems. This is inherent synergy between predicting new quantum systems and, of course, using them in, in future. Usually, when I tell people that we're predicting stuff or about computational physics, um, the hope is that I have some acronym, a magic acronym, a method that, that describes all of these systems all at once. So I'll just start with the, the bad news here. There's no single method that allows us to, to go from these uh, confined systems, thinking about these quantum defects, all the way to, to thinking about um, you know, how they interact with the environment, how they behave when they're hosted in a bulk lattice and all of that good stuff. So we develop methods that allow us to bridge across those land scales, but also think about the properties that we want. So whether we're thinking about orbital density is very important for these artificial atom qubits. They're very, very localized and confined, but also how they behave when they're coupling to the lattice or what that potential energy surface would look like. We think about the, the phase diagram of these systems. And of course, as we're coupling to the cavity, we have developed new methods, both in um, ultra strong coupling to um, the, the cavity and also uh, ways that say you could use um, magnetic excitations. And that's actually something I'll tell you about later in my, my talk today. 
you're interested in any of the methods that we develop, a lot of them are available open source. So I encourage you to, to reach out or ask us for, for access to our GitHub repositories and, and start playing around with it. So I'll tell you about two primary topics today, how we predict these new artificial atom qubits, both in 3D and 2D host lattices. Going from there, I'll tell you about how we control these systems. So, so the various excitations that are possible, whether they're purely optical, optomechanical, whether we use uh, magna mediated schemes and where the lattice can either harm or help you in, in using these artificial atom qubits. So to a material science audience, when I say quantum defects or defects of any sort, the first reaction is, oh no, defects, bad, must be avoided. I'd like you to take a slightly different opinion of defects here today and think about unlocking their superpower, because essentially some of these defects, not all, could act as um, optically accessible spin states in, in these um, various lattices, in particular diamond, which I'm going to tell you about next, is a really good example of, of these uh, systems. Of course, we know about you know, the, the various ways people have looked at real uh, AMO systems, maybe something that Monica will, will tell us about uh, in her talk next. Here, you could think of exactly that, or not quite exactly, but very similar physics hosted in a lattice, but of course you're coupling to the lattice. So there are some advantages, but also some disadvantages associated with that. But the lens scales here are actually lens scales that now would be determined by the material itself, both for coupling between emitters, but also for coupling to say surfaces and, and coupling to um, the, the lattice, right? So as we are thinking about coupling, it's not only important for us to have a single emitter, it's, it's most of the schemes that are based on these um, in, involve either arrays of these emitters and they could be coupled uh, very far away, say, say by strain, and there are various schemes for gates that could be implemented if you have uh, regimes of, of high strain coupling. They could be very, very close to each other, which is what you would need if they're supposed to be dipole couples. And you could use that, for example, to create on-demand um, tangle pairs. In that regime, you're really talking about being, being you know, on, the, on the order of a nanometer or a couple of nanometers. And, and that's a, a very different regime than say where, where things are coupled a micron apart. You can also think about other ways of um, coupling these across an array or using another material that then couples to each individual emitter to, to create um, a nice collective state. So we started by thinking about group four quantum emitters in, in diamond, in particular inspired by the various experiments that had been done for the group four negatively charged centers. Okay, so of course you have a, a defect in diamond, it can adopt various different charged states it could either be a preferred charge state or via various co-doping strategies, you could get it to be in a not preferred charge state. The preferred charge state for group four in diamond is the negative charge state. The other charge state, which um, is, is the one that is in some ways more, more exciting is, is, the, is the neutrally charged um, electronic configuration, which is of interest because at that point you have a ground state spin triplet and you could essentially get very long spin coherence times. So group four, negative silicon, um, germanium, tin, and, and lead, they've been predicted. We uh, predicted the negatively charged lead vacancy in diamond. It was subsequently experimentally realized. But the group four neutrals have, have remained harder to find, harder to understand. Um, a really good example of, of the work in this, um, in the neutrally charged um, emitters is the silicon vacancy neutrals work by Natalie Dillion and others where they've found spin one, very nice long spin coherence. Seems like you can combine the best of all worlds, both the NV as well as say the SIV negative. Okay, and of course with, with the co-doping schemes, maybe you could find cool ways to, to uh, get to this neutrally charged electronic configuration. So when we started thinking about the system, we really wanted to establish a theoretical ab initio understanding of both the electronic and the spin structure. That is critical not only to understanding the defects that we have, but also to finding the ones that we don't. So silicon vacancy neutral has been found, but the germanium, tin, lead, not yet. 
And the question was, well, are people already seeing signatures of this? Is there a reason it's fundamentally hard to find? Um, how should we think about it? And would it have similar or even better properties in some cases than the known silicon vacancy neutral? So in this case, um, maybe it's useful for us to, to think about the, the level structure, the, both the ground and the excited state of, of the group force. This is one of those systems where um, perhaps you, you've seen the word Jan Teller come up uh, a few different times. It's because the spin orbit split, which of course increases going from silicon all the way to, to the lead vacancy in Timon, is could be actually strongly quenched by the, the Jan Teller effect. And that would have an impact, say, on the, the uh, vibronic spectrum, or if you're trying to identify uh, the defect relative to something else, you maybe would want to know exactly where the zero phonon line is, is located. And of course, as we think about the efficiency of these systems, you'd want most of the emission to go into zero phonon line, not in the phonon sidebands. So you'd want to know what that, what that branching is. And that's exactly why uh, we started thinking about predicting these and, and started thinking about the, the Jan Teller effect in these, um, in these systems, because that would really impact where you would predict their zero phonon line to be. Okay, so Jan Teller effect, it's a, a very, very quick introduction uh, to, to the, the Jan Teller effect. So essentially any system where you've created an orbital imbalance, either because of an optical excitation, uh, which is the case here, or, or some other reason, you start to see this Jan Teller instability. And the system essentially uh, wants to, to uh, lower its energy and um, it could do that by coupling the electronic structure to the nuclear motion. So now you're talking about a system that involves both the electronic and the, the nuclear degrees of freedom. So it's, it's important for us now to think about this as a coupled electron phonon system. I use the word here strongly coupled, and you might say, okay, it's coupled, but why is it strongly coupled? Well, in this case, if you try, say, to first order to, to separate out what the, the behavior of the system would look like as, as it tries to lower that energy, you couldn't easily separate the electronic and the nuclear um, degrees of freedom here. And what we realized is actually for this particular system, you not only want to think about, um, you know, the, the Jan Teller to first order, which you get these rotationally symmetric minima about the, the high symmetry point. This is the, the proverbial uh, Mexican hat potential that uh, comes up in various types of order parameter physics. But actually, you want to think about the Jan Teller effect to second order. And here you get this, uh, it's, it's a very distorted, maybe a uh, Halloween hat uh, with, with buckling that gives you these three degenerate minima. And essentially, it, it would be you know, uh, a way that the, the system would have to go, say, from one of these points to a, a uh, lower energy point, and that's something that would give you this coupling between the electronic and the vibrational states. This strong coupling here is actually because now we can't separate those out, so we should be thinking about these as vibronic states. So there's something you walk away with from, from this Jan Teller discussion, and, and maybe some of you are thinking this is uh, uh, a lot of uh, jargon or, or theory going on. It's it's uh, it's that these are, are vibronic states, and in fact, the strong coupling between the electron and the phonon is actually what what changes the, the behavior of these um, uh, group four emitters. And it's why predicting these emitters in the past, say from your favorite uh, density functional or other quasi particle method, has been incredibly challenging. So predictions have been off not only by a couple of MEV, MEV, but you know, by, by fractions of an EV because of that. So um, the Jan Teller also, you, so you might say, well, why did we stop at, at second order? Well, it turns out we tried higher orders and, and doesn't really have an impact, but also the second order is actually what, what can shift the absolute energies. And it is what leads to a quenching of the, the spin orbit coupling um, in these um, group four neutrals. Okay. So we've been able to predict this, and we've been able to look at the product Yantella, which is essentially a product of two dynamic Yantellers. So it's literally uh, uh, taking the, the system and, and uh, tensoring those, those two problems. And you get constructive and destructive interference with these single Yantellers, and you can study the, the full potential energy surface associated with these uh, group four neutral quantum emitters. So we are able to do that for the second vacancy neutral, as well as for the others that have not yet been identified, both to first and, and second order. When we look at the silicon vacancy neutral, we capture this um, 
effect. And we find actually that it's not only important to treat these as vibronic states, but also to invoke a non-perturbative treatment of the spin orbit coupling here, which is not something you would conventionally need to do in order to describe, say, say diamonds, not, not something you, you, you think of in the, in the context of diamond. But it's important to where silicon vacancy neutral, which has been experimentally identified, we get really good agreement with um, the, the experimental work. For, for the other four, um, for the other three group four emitters, we, we hope that it will guide experimental search of, of these. Emboldened by the fact that we were able to predict uh, the, the group four, uh, we said, okay, well, what else is, you know, so, so with the group four neutrals, I keep saying co-doping and I keep saying it's hard to get this non-preferred chart state. Well, can we find a system where it does adopt the, the preferred chart state. This is where you look at uh, a nice uh, periodic table and say, well, let's take a step to the left, look at group three, which would also be uh, isoelectronic, but maybe the preferred chart state there would be something that is um, you know, that gives you the spin once. We got lucky. And in fact, we predict that this is a class of uh, uh, spin one color centers and that you should find very, very, um, high efficiency emission into zero phone online, coupled with that um, very nice uh, spin physics that people have seen in the silicon vacancy neutral. So an experimental search is underway. And uh, if you're on the call and inspired to go implant diamond and, and look for these, I encourage you to, to do that um, as soon as possible. Okay, so with diamond, one of the biggest problems is that you know, it's, it's a 3D lattice, which is good, but also um, controllable placement of where these emitters go is incredibly hard, which leads to, to thinking about 2D materials where all the, all the atoms are on the surface. So you can maybe, uh, you know, think it, it feels more natural to make these arrays in, in, in 2D materials because you can access everything. So maybe go in with the uh, STM tip or use STEM to actually move things around. With everything that sounds that good, there's usually a catch with 2D materials. And I, I know uh, a lot of uh, 2D folks are, are um, called in today. There's interaction with the environment, there's a substrate somewhere, but there are also long range effects. For example, um, you could see that, that the system relaxes out of plane. So even though it's a 2D layer, it could have that 3D component and that would change the behavior in plane, uh, not only the, the optical properties, but also um, the decoherence uh, associated with these quantum emitters. I'll give you two examples of, of things we've done here. One in hexagonal boron nitride. Hexagonal boron nitride is a, a really, really fun material. Um, but in this context, also really fun because some of the initial experiments in hexagonal boron nitride showed that you could have these um, stable emitters that, that could emit all the way up to, um, well, not quite room temperature, but nearly room temperature. So that's in contrast with all the properties that have been observed, say, in, in diamond that have been at know, millikelvin temperatures. And um, so it's, it's very uh, exciting that people were able to find uh, emitters in, in hexagonal boron nitride at higher temperatures. Part of the problem though was which one is the emitter and how, how do we actually, is it, is it the, the um, you know, native uh, point defects? Are they defect complexes? And, and if so, how do they behave? Can we image them? So this is work in uh, collaboration with uh, Jen Dion's group at Stanford, where using a combination of our predictions as well as cathodoluminescence and photoluminescence study, studies done in, in a, a STEM column, we are able to understand the defect emission as well as the impact of strain on the source of defect emission. So, um, so we go back to, to where I was telling you something about diamond. One thing that was implicit was that, you know, if you have strain in the lattice, you would change coupling uh, to the phonons, which means that the zero phonon line would move. So in the case of hexagonal boron nitride, one of the reasons people were seeing essentially uh, a zoo of emission was uh, attributed to local strain. And the, the belief prior to our, um, and prior to our work was that um, by, by by understanding the strain, you'd be able to map exactly which emitter it was back to the, the native point defects. And what we showed is that for uh, a few layers of hexagonal boron nitride, this is important, it's not a, not a monolayer, this is uh, the order of, of uh, a few layers that, that we looked at. Um, we can isolate, so we can do um, imaging, we here meaning uh, Faria, who led the work on this. So she was able to figure out a few different points from, from where you could see emission. Um, get a photoluminescent spectrum from the same spot 
um, go ahead and do cathodoluminescence, which is uh, something, of course, that would pump in a lot more energy into uh, the material, and then come back and for many, but not all, find photoluminescence from those same spots. So we start to understand that and say, okay, well, there are probably a set of emitters that are stable to this repeated photoluminescence, cathodoluminescence, PL cycling, and some that maybe uh, once you um, do some CL measurement actually have enough energy to, to either reorganize or because um, you don't find emission there again, right? Okay, so we were able to look at um, not only that, but also the strain maps and see if the, the predictions of the zero phonon line, again, uh, you know, uniaxial or, or biaxial strain uh, could, be, could be something that uh, is directly correlated with what is experimentally, see, experimentally seen and if that could help us identify um, the behavior of these defects. One takeaway we got from this that, that I hope um, will inspire other experiments in this area is that it's most certainly not the simple nitrogen vacancy or the, the native point defects. These are defect complexes. They're not energetically favorable to form, uh, which is why you wouldn't put them in the, the easiest to form list, but that's exactly why they're also stable and retain some of these properties to higher temperatures. So the hope is that that gives some, um, some uh, design principles for emitter uh, discovery in future. Unlike hexagonal boron nitride, another system that natively has a lot of defects is, uh, are, are the uh, TMTCs. In particular, um, we wanted to look at MOS2 with, with uh, including, say, a heavier or a larger defect to see what would happen if you had, say, a few of these defects uh, in, in somewhat close proximity to each other. What would they do? Uh, and how would the material that is not defective respond? Right. So this is, again, uh, the material science perspective of this would be, well, if I start making arrays of defects, I suddenly have a, a, a material that looks very, very defective, and maybe the material itself um, is, is something that will, will start to show, say, features of, of disorder. Maybe instead of a nice, pristine electronic structure, we'll start to see a lot of shadow bands appear, and that's exactly uh, what happens. But we wanted to quantify that, and this is uh, an experiment uh, done in collaboration with uh, John Miao's group at uh, UCLA, where they can do a scanning uh, AT uh, technique, essentially. And this, this allows you to get the specific coordinates for, say, a, a macroscopic area of, uh, of uh, 2D material. And you can get the coordinates with extremely high precision. In their case, for sulfur with 15 picometer precision, radium 12, and, and molybdenum with, with 4 picometer uh, precision, which, which to, to me was um, mind-blowing. So we said, OK, well, with those coordinates, how about we try and compare if using the exact experimental coordinates versus what we predict from, from theory, how the, for, for that same defect complex, what would happen uh, to the electronic structure. And what we found was something uh, quite surprising, actually. The real system, the, the experimentally measured coordinates, actually are substantially uh, higher energy. There are uh, systems that uh, essentially show not only, this is not just your, your eyes or, or uh, bad resolution, this is a, a very, uh, very many shadow bands here, a lot of disorder. And for that same system for, say, two rheniums at molybdenum sites that are uh, coupling, what we predict from theory is something that looks a lot cleaner. And um, part of that actually changes not only the, the electronic structure, but also the coupling that each of these uh, defects would have um, to the lattice. So essentially, once you start to have a lot of defects, the system doesn't have, this is the physical interpretation, have enough energy to find that relaxed coordinate configuration, which is the equilibrium coordinates, which is what we would normally look at in theory. It gets stuck in some, um, some, some other uh, slightly, or in some cases, much higher energy uh, minimum and, and ne can never get out of it. It doesn't have enough energy to, to rearrange. And in this case, it relaxes out of plane. So you start to see a, a lot of um, distortions that are in the, in, in, in the third dimension. So even if it is a, a 2D material, you start to see uh, coupling out of plane. That was really exciting to us. Building on that, we've now been uh, collaborating with, with Francis Ross to, to start to see how uh, say if you had defects that were also trapped in MRA potential, uh, what periodicity and what potential would they see? And this is where I think it's, it's helpful to have that uh, feedback between theory and experiment. 
Okay, so for the second half of my talk, uh, or well, hopefully not, not quite half, I'll tell you about controlling um, the, the interactions. And this is going from the, this is the, the lattice we have, this is the disorder we have, to actually actively introducing elements that allow us to, to couple these emitters. So again, going back to TMDs, one of the things that we realized is that with, with say, um, the sulfur vacancy in MOS2 or in tungsten uh, sulfide, you could actually charge that particular uh, vacancy. And what you'd want to do is understand the, the coupling. Uh, so that would be a dynamical response to so say you came in with an SCM tip and you were able to, to charge it. And this is not, uh, not, not so unthinkable. People have done that experimentally. What you would see is the coupling to the local phonon modes change, right? So you, um, and what you want to contrast that with is uh, whether you've charged it electrically or if you've optically excited into that and you're uh, constraining the configuration. So that context, uh, what we do is, is look at this uh, within the, the frank condon approximation. Uh, we can discuss why that could or could not hold in this particular case, but there you're saying essentially that excitation is instantaneous and I could think about the population and, and of the, the excited state, and then I can start thinking about its coupling. And this is another example of where the, the electron phonon interaction and the spin orbit coupling have this, um, have this interplay, uh, again, looking for, for that single uh, charge calcogen uh, vacancy. So I won't dwell on this too much. We're able to, to predict the, the Wang Ries factor for both the molybdenum and the tungsten. So that was to contrast the spin orbit, of course, going from molybdenum to, to tungsten, and also thinking about if you were able to either singly or doubly charge that calcogen vacancy, how, how would its coupling to the, the environment change? So that's one of the examples of dynamic modulation. In this case, it would be phonon assisted. Another way to think about this is if you could use the, the uh, fact that these, um, many of these defects are, have strain susceptibility, but there's also a lot of inhomogeneous broadening associated with, say, various different emitters included either in uh, diamond or in, in a 2D material. So I was just to say that even if it's the same defect, it doesn't emit at that same spot. So you could couple in that dispersive regime and you could actually use that to, to uh, control these emitters and, and have some selective uh, coupling between them. And there are two examples of this being uh, uh, done uh, quite successfully um, by, by Misha Lukin and by uh, Marco Longcar in cavity mediated interactions. This is where uh, you're using an optic chemical cavity or uh, to use strain modulation. So this is um, you know, a very high strain regime and, and you're able to, to uh, modulate the transition frequencies of those emitters and get them to interact with each other. This would be the resonant. Uh, uh, regime, but you could do the same thing. And uh, this would be, uh, again, taking advantage of the fact that there is some homogeneous broadening to couple, say, three different emitters selectively. So you would, you would um, essentially be able to use the, the optimum mechanical control to, to get them to, to talk to each other and use an external optical uh, drive to pick out which one you're, you're coupling to. So uh, we showed the scheme and we think that this is uh, a fairly promising way to, to go about uh, coupling various emitters in, in diamond. So at this point, it still seems a little bit like taking lemons and, and making lemonade. But another way you could do this very, very intentionally is to use magnon-mediated spin-spin interactions, okay? So magnons are really fun. Magnons in, in superconducting uh, quantum systems are actually quite common. And they more recently have been advances in showing the strong coupling between a microwave cavity photon and magnon, say, of a magnetic particle or a, a nanoparticle. Okay, in this case, a nanoparticle is on the order of hundreds of nanometers, so slightly different uh, lens scale. And, and folks have shown things like single shot, single magnon uh, detection. Um, and actually coupling magnons to, to spin emitters is, is a natural direction. And, and for some reason, is a, a little bit underexplored, but it could provide a pathway for very efficient manipulation of, of spin qubit states. So something that we show in, um, in our work is first, how you could get uh, coupling between a single emitter. So here the R is uh, 50 nanometers and that A is 1.2 R. So these are very uh, realizable lens scales. We show this for a Yig sphere, but it would work for any ferro ferromagnetic system. Uh, so you can predict the magnon modes 
um, and, and you'll see on the, the right here the uh, very, very uh, messy looking <laughs> uh, spectral density and as, as a function of, of the magnetic fields. Uh, so we're interested in the dipolar Kittel mode here. So that's uh, omega over omega k being uh, equal to one. Though of course you see a, a bunch of uh, higher order modes as well. We think about this nanomagnetic cavity now as a way of taking this uh, gigahertz magnetic field to a deeply sub-wavelength regime. And essentially that enhances a coupling to a spin emitter. And these coupling strengths can actually exceed, say, the inherent losses or uh, the, the decoherence, right? So, and this is not only exciting for being able to couple to, to the spin emitter, but actually also changing the, the selection rules associated with it. So in this particular case, we look at the spectral density, but also in describing uh, the emitter-emitter coupling, uh, we, we invoke full non-Markovian dynamics of the excited states. So, so we're within the Weisskopf uh, Wigner approximation here, and, and we think about the, uh, so the, the coefficient here, the excited state uh, coefficient. Of course, norm, norm squared here would give you uh, the population of that excited state. Okay, so using that, what you can do is get very, very long range emitter emitter coupling, right? So now uh, we've gone from trying to do something that is say on the order of a few nanometer or tens of nanometers to something that can be on the order of microns and uh, much more realizable by using these six spheres that are coupling, perhaps sitting on uh, a surface of diamond. And you could create various, and these are mediated now by a, a single magnon modes. You could think about using some of the higher more higher order modes as well. This could allow you to couple across those emitters at, at very uh, reasonable end scales and introduce magnon mediated uh, gates. So that's where we're, we're going in, in future with this uh, magnetic uh, excitation direction is, is to think about, you know, uh, cascaded cavities and essentially taking some of the ideas from um, other uh, photonic or, or phononic uh, cavity design and seeing how many of those can be implemented in, in nanomagnetic systems. Um, to, to finish up here, something else that, that is super important, of course, you know, I've, I've glossed over this a, a little bit today, but um, most of these systems are not isotopically pure. So you need to think about not only uh, coupling between the spin lattice, but also spin-spin coupling. And um, you, could, you could think of uh, the, the nuclear bath as either um, detrimental, or you could think of it as, as a resource, and you could think about uh, doing some, some reservoir engineering associated with it. So we're, we're looking at both, so we're thinking about how you can quantitatively predict uh, decoherence in these systems, uh, especially as they are coupling to, to the environment, and also how you can use the environment itself as a resource, again, invoking full non-Markovian dynamics, how you can use that as, as a reservoir of information, say, of, of doing something uh, a little more uh, for, for long-term memory in, in, in this context. So I'll summarize and say, told you about predicting new artificial atom qubits, both in 3D and 2D hosts. Um, in, in the group four and group three in, in diamond, how we've thought about hexagonal boron nitride, uh, various ways to intersect with atomic scale imaging to quantify um, effects in, in these systems. And uh, in the second half, I told you about how you can get emitter-emitter coupling, how you can use dynamical control, say, say via strain field, or if you're really fancy with, with these uh, magnon mediated spin-spin uh, interactions. So thanks to funding and uh, to wonderful people I've worked with, happy to take any and all questions. And thank you again, Donna and, and James for having me here. Thanks, Pri. That was a great talk. So I think I'll follow uh, James' lead and see if there are any um, panel or people who can activate their audio who have questions first, and then I'll move to questions in the Q&A. Uh, hi, George Nance. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, George. Okay, all right. So uh, yeah, so this whole business about spin orbit effects and, and uh, the, the uh, you know, these NV centers in, in the group fours. I mean, you know, there's only, I mean, obviously you worked really hard on, on the Jan Teller description of the problem and, and, but the spin orbit sort of undoes the Jan Teller to a certain extent. I mean, to what extent do you have to work hard on, on the Jan Teller part and just put in the spin orbit later uh, as opposed to, you know, other versions? Right, um, excellent question. So when we originally started predicting these, we were treating them as, as decoupled. We found is that it can make uh, a difference of on the order of actually in some cases 100 MeV, which is really, really big. Um, you'd expect, you know, if it was a couple of MeV, this would 
be fine. We, we'd be off uh, a little bit, but um, you know, 100 MEV is, is, a, is, a, is a big number. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the Jan Teller in this case quench it, leads to a, a strong uh, um, spin orbit quench. And, and that was unexpected because again, the diamond lattice is, is very light. So, so you wouldn't necessarily expect that um, effect. Um, to, to what extent we would need to do that in general for any Jan Teller unstable system, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but particularly for, for diamond, we find that to be a surprisingly big effect. So uh, we hope to include it in, in uh, other systems as well. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to grab one question from the Q&A, and then I think in the interest of time, we'll have to uh, move on to the next speaker. Uh, so we have a question, uh, which I think is near and dear to the hearts of many in this audience, which is, are there other promising materials that you are planning to study? Um, absolutely. So uh, with, with the uh, TMDs, I think there is uh, a lot of opportunity because they're actually based on, say, the tacogen or, or the uh, metal atom, you have a lot of control over the, the spin orbit. Um, so, so we're looking at other um, TMDs. We're, um, you know, of course, thinking about also systems like lithium niobate, where there's other nonlinear optics you could do. And if you could also have the emitter be hosted in lithium niobate, maybe you could get uh, some, some interesting uh, physics there. So rather than having uh, a combination of diamond and lithium niobate, you could do it all in, in that one uh, system. Um, there are other uh, 2D systems where you could uh, think about, you know, these. Um, so, so you can make, uh, you know, and, and Dan, I'm, I'm sure uh, you're, you're, right, of course, an expert in this, in, in making um, chains of, of molecules, essentially, or um, having molecules that are replacing, so uh, a larger section of the 2D material and are, are somehow linked. And that would be a hybrid organic and organic scheme. And you could really get a lot of the molecular control while still having a rigid 2D uh, material lattice there. So. So there are ideas there. Uh, of course, it's a little bit further behind, uh, say, diamond, silicon carbide, HBN. Um, but if there are interesting properties there, then maybe there'll be uh, interest in, in going about these uh, experimentally. Yeah. I have to say I love that answer. Um, so with that, um, thank you for a great talk. And I will turn this over to Professor Rondinelli uh, to introduce our final speaker.